I, I can pretty much economize what the point of what I want to say, and then maybe if you know there's I know it's late in the day here, and uh, but if it does kind of spark some thoughts or ideas, and you have questions. Um, I'd much rather hear from you guys about what I'm going to say and, and get your thoughts about it. Um, so I really will try to kind of move up quickly here. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to lay out a framework for how we think about innovation at the Harvard Business Review um, and how we think about innovating specifically um, on mobile platforms. So I'm going to kind of quickly give you the framework, and it comes from someone who writes for us. His name is Vijay Govindarajan, and I'll take you through it very quickly. I think it's really powerful, it's very interesting, and it's really all about trying to balance what I think we're all talking about here today, which is how is it that we're going to get into the future and innovate and create things when you're sort of answering the needs of your customer today and you're running the business today. So, Quickly, this is probably a very familiar slide. It could be almost any publisher today. This is the growth of mobile over the last few years for HBR. I'm sure for some of you, this slide would be even bigger, right? But it, it, early on with mobile, there was this interesting thing where all of a sudden you were like, well, we do, you know, we've got tablet, we've got mobile, we've got desktop. How is it we do our print, in our case, how is it that we can you know, innovate on this platform. It's really difficult. We, we talk a lot about kind of getting the right work done. Where are you focusing your time? But early on, there was this thing called responsive design. So just show of hands, any you know, publishers who, in this room who use responsive design? Right. This was a huge savior. This basically took, in the upper left-hand corner here, hbr.org, and said, OK, well, it's easy enough now. We can put it across mobile. We can put it across tablet. We can bundle it all together. And this became a familiar game plan for most of us. A lot of publishers were doing this, bundling offers, multi-platform, leveraging the technology as best you could so that you didn't have to produce across all these platforms. But then something kind of changed, but it, it was percolating in the background all the time. And that was that mobile and social started to become equated. And that really, most recently, and I think the last speaker was talking to this, it really changed the whole field. Because all of a sudden, you know, new competitors, new threats, new opportunities. But the truth is, it was percolating in the background all the time. Actually, many years back, you could sort of see it. Something I'll, call, I'll talk about a little bit later, but there were weak signals that, could, that talked to this, right? So. The question is, now, with all this happening, how do you get at this opportunity? And it's really tough, because if you're HBR, or maybe you guys, someone you know, in this audience here, you're outfitted to do a certain thing. You're outfitted either, or usually around the desktop, and you've probably gotten pretty good at that. And this is what um, our friend uh, Vijay Govindarajan, who, um, well, I'll show you his book. I don't know where I put it. But, he talks about something called the dominant logic. And this is a really interesting thing. And I won't go too much into it, but you can read this, and these slides will be available. But this is basically how you get things done today. And it's really powerful. The way your business works today, is a, there's a logic to it. And when new things come along, people say, we can't do that. And usually they say they can't do it for good reason, because they're serving the customer today. An editor is doing their job that creates value for the customer today. And if all of a sudden you say, we want to do something very different, there's a lot of resistance. And a lot of times what people find is that innovation just fails because of the dominant logic of the organization, right? So what Govinda Rajan thought a lot about, and he's a professor, as you can see, at Dartmouth's Tuck Business School. He also teaches at Harvard Business School as well. What he sort of laid out was what he calls three boxes. Again, I'm sort of rushing here because I'm going to get to the example of what, what we're doing here. But very simply, he just sort of has, you know, box one is the present, what you do to serve your customer today, OK? Box three is, what do you need to do 10 or 15 years from now to serve your future customer? So in our case, we talk to a lot of CEOs. So, you know, where, where is, what is that 30-something who may be, you know, maturing into an HBR reader? What are they going to want from us? And those are box three. That's sort of box three. Now, the second one, box two on the far left here, 
is the trickiest one because that's the stuff that you're going to stop doing. And this is the hardest part. I think when, if you're like me and you like to do innovation and you're entrepreneurial, what you have to remember is that you just can't load up more on, well you can, you know, on your editors or on your sales force or whatever, but eventually there's sort of a breaking point. You've got you've to reduce something that you're doing. Something's got to give. So you, we really look hard at what is it that you're not going to do? What, what's just not providing value anymore? For some of us it'll be frequency. You know, there's just more print. Sometimes it's a section or the, you know, the newspapers. If you look at newspapers today, they still print the weather. Can they stop doing that? You know, that's not really, it doesn't feel like that. It's a huge value add at this point. So box two is really, really important, but what I'm gonna focus on is, is box three and, and how you get at that. So how you think you're gonna intersect with the customer 10 or 15 years from now is really powerful because none of us can tell the future, right? So you don't want to spend a zillion dollars going after opportunities that just don't happen because you're making wild bets. So there's kind of a way here to incrementally move forward and experiment, but do it somewhat methodically. And where Govindarajan starts is with weak signals, right? So there are all around us, and these are just kind of rough categories, and he uses a company, one of his great examples is a game company in the United States, Hasbro that in the 90s started to see, now in retrospect, you can think, a, a company that makes board games in the 1990s, you can clearly see that the world of the internet is going to jeopardize that business. But what they looked at were a whole bunch of weak signals about the way families were interacting, right? The way the, the phenomena we call bowling alone, people spending more time by themselves, all these different things, they tried to add those up and they tested forward new concepts that allowed them to build out kind of whole new ways of with their current games and with new games to meet their customers' needs. So I'm going to sort of show you how we look at these, these weak signals at HBR. Now some of them here are, you know, millennials. Obviously millennials, they tell me they're growing up, they're getting married. Uh, baby boomers might be leaving the workforce, taking on new challenges, new technologies, self-driving car. No idea what this means. I mean, if you're creating a newspaper today, I mean, you've got to believe that, you know, you've, you've got to believe people are going to be consuming their content in totally different ways, getting the news completely in different ways. How do you experiment with that now? If you're a media site now, should you be working with Ford? Should you be, you know, running some experiment? It's really an interesting question. Virtual reality is another one. There are players out there like the New York Times. They're doing amazing things with storytelling, right? And I think with, that's been talked about here. But it's expensive. It's difficult. How do you do that in a way and how do you make, the, make decisions around what, what, to, uh, what to follow? Well, part of it is you start to ask yourself these questions about, you know, these future ideas, right? Who, who is that customer that you think you're going after? Really try to be specific about it. Try to strategize around where, where you think they'll be, what they'll be demanding, and really think, and, and it's a little, it, it takes analysis. It takes, you know, some looking at data and thinking and coming up with a theory of what you think those weak signals are. But really trying to answer these questions is important. All right, so then let's shift over to HBR. And this is a little tricky to see, unfortunately, but it's the growth for, of HBR's social uh, traffic over time. And in 2012, it was really interesting. We, we were already growing quite a bit um, with social at that point. But it, the, really interesting, LinkedIn launched something, influencers, right? That was really probably a weak signal, weak to strong signal. Influencers, thought leaders, sounds a lot like HBR, right? We knew then and there that social media, these big players, were moving more and more into our space. But we're picking up those signals and it's growing, right? And, and it's important, because it's an important source of traffic for us. Okay, so we do a couple things. We run experiments that are low cost, and we try and do a little and learn a lot. But we're really methodical about what we try to learn. And then we think about bigger bets. So I'm gonna show you a few experiments that we're doing, and you might be doing similar ones. And then I'm gonna talk to you about a bigger box three bet, and kind of why we're doing it, and how we're doing it. So the smaller things are, you know, instant article. The United States, Washington Post, they're all over this. It doesn't cost that much to kind of distribute, but it is something that your organization needs to do. 
We'll experiment there slowly. Uh, Slack, a productivity tool that's connected within organizations, we're creating a Slack bot. It's not a lot of money, it's easy enough to do. You're gonna basically use Slack and you're gonna be able to ask it questions about management and get ideas back from HBR, right? Not sure what that really means. There's no real monetization there. The whole point is to kind of structure an experiment around it and learn as much as possible about, for us, how it is that we're engaging managers and specifically younger managers who are growing up with these tools who are going to become our future customer. There's one nice thing. Everyone puts a lot of pressure on themselves and you can hear it in all the presentations. Like, you know, Google's coming, Facebook's coming. They, they are coming. But it takes years for these things to happen. If you're paying attention, you actually have a lot of time if you really think about it. The future customer that we're trying to reach, who will reach the C-suite and we hope gets Harvard Business Review, but if we don't do these things, probably won't even know about us, but it's gonna take years. So there's a lot of time to experiment and really think about that box three is out there. It also helps in your organizations to think about experimenting with intersecting with a customer in the future because it doesn't threaten the, what the editors and the, the, the salespeople, what they're doing today. Right? They still feel good about that, but way out in the future, you know, let's do some experiments. Slackbot would be one. Facebook Live is another one. This one was a great one. Ran right headlong into the dominant logic of HBR. We said, let's do live every day on Facebook. And the editors were like, what do you think we are? The, you know, the National Football League? What do you, I mean, what, what are people gonna watch of HBR live? You know, there's no action, there's no, but we pushed it as, let's try it as an experiment to see what we could learn. We actually, in the few weeks we've been doing it, um, some of these talks have gotten 90,000 people to come, more than 3,000 people to a talk, putting up to Harvard Business, I mean, think about that. Uh, to me, it blows my mind. I mean, we are spinach. I mean, this is not sexy stuff, as you can tell. You know, but uh, all of a sudden, new ideas popped up. Professors were doing things, we started to call them chalk talks maybe bringing to life their ideas in new ways, new ways of creating value, new ways of impact, things that Khan Academy is already doing, but now all of a sudden in this new context, we're learning about. But it all comes down to, you know, back to our core mission, how we're trying to engage people, we're learning quickly. I'm not sure that this will survive at all, but it is telling us something about the future customer. So, the last one for us has been podcasts, which is a little tricky because there have been signals around this one for a long time. When I started in the early 90s with the web, podcasts became all the rage, it died down, now it's back because of serial and other things. We are, um, we've always had a presence on this platform because of our idea cast, which is fine, that's great. Now we're partnering with a public radio station to actually create much, much more of a level of radio broadcast. They're, they're totally experimental. We'll see what it means, but again, it's all about intersecting with that future customer. Now these are sort of on the lower end, but what you can do, I think, with box three is you can pick out maybe one thing, and I'll tell you why I would suggest only one thing, to kind of invest in a bigger way. Now for us, that turns out to be something in India. So very quickly, uh, I know we're gonna be running out of time here. HBR, global brand, we have a big presence in India, we have a subsidiary there um, that's been growing, it's fantastic, but it's always been with the magazine. And the magazine has only reached a small number of elite CEOs in, in India. We've never really had much luck penetrating below, uh, below that in, in that market. So, you know, we thought, what are the weak signals about India? And what's happening on the mobile front? Which some of you may know, but we started to analyze it. And you, you look at the, the penetration of the internet users, but also improving infrastructure, this movement to 4G that's happening the movement to texting, there's a lot of weak and strong signals there that a new generation of workers, of potential managers and executives are interacting, or could be interacting with content in a very different way, but it's a long way off. And it's not just these kind of, you know, stats. You also have to look at other things. So look at, you know, there's a, 4G in a place like India is actually coming to rural areas. More women are coming online. What does this add up to? It's, well, wait a second here. More people in rural areas 
maybe they're not prepared for the workforce. Maybe we could recast HBR and our ideas on a mobile platform that they're getting somehow in a way that could help them to be more prepared in their careers as managers, as executives, or just get them ready for the workforce. Here's the interesting thing. That's not what HBR does. So a big part of my job is managing the friction between the people working on box one and the people here working on box three. This is by design. There are ones in Boston and ones in, in India, so there's a lot of space between them. But it's really important that they're not disassociated. We talk about forget, borrow, learn. So box, the, the folks who are working on these future, they're leveraging a lot of content from HBR, right? But they're recasting it. But the editors back home are thinking, that's not what we do. You know, we don't go after that audience. We, we talk to, an, you know, we don't talk to, you know, 30-somethings who are just getting a phone for the first time in rural India. We talk to the lead executives. How are we going to talk to them? A lot of it is meeting with people from kind of both camps, and there's a lot of friction. And that's one thing I'll tell you, that if you really want to do this right, you kind of have to manage that, because you are going to leverage your core to innovate for the future. Um, okay, so uh, very quickly, for us, I went through some of this. There's a couple other reasons around why India, um, for us in particular. One is, you know, it, it's an emerging market. We're in other emerging markets. If we can come up with a model, that's interesting. There's another thing, reverse innovation, where companies like GE basically build things in developing markets at a very low cost that are very accessible, and then they've had success bringing them back to more developed markets. And I actually think that's one of the tricks of what we're doing. We're getting into using WhatsApp and other technologies in India for a younger audience with a different model, a different business model, in a way that would really be tough for us to just go after in the United States. But if we can see success there, maybe we bring it back. So it's really, it, it's really interesting. Um, it's exciting. By the way, it's kind of cool for me because I love to be able to innovate and everything. But you know. Um, it allows me to be involved in a, in a somewhat deep way. The, the last thing here, I'm going to really rush because I don't mean to turn this into a business school class, but, but the, the, the <laughs> it's sort of my nature, I guess, um, <laughs> where I come from. But the, the thing is, you, you might be finding that you're really testing whole new models. And this, you, you should be careful about it because most of us, and I think Clay Christensen puts it best here, and again, you can read this on your own, but. Most of us don't always understand what's really driving our businesses in the first place. So Clay, and he sort of sets that out here, but he also sets out something about business models that I just find it to be so simple. And he talks about at the heart of your business model is a job to be done. In other words, your publication is being hired by someone when they read it to do a job. It has a purpose. And that purpose, you build processes around that allow you to make money somehow, right? But that's your value. That's the heart of the business model. So as you go forward and you're thinking about, wait a second, we're innovating, we're doing new things, I'd encourage you to think about what new jobs, what new value can you recast HBR for a new audience and maybe serves a new purpose. But it's, that's moving towards a new model. And that's great. But uh, I think you want to be cognizant of it is all. So, and this is just kind of, for folks, you know, just the kind of the basic components to think about of, of a business model. So I, I wanted to go, I know I would kind of rushed through a lot of that. I know it's late in the day as well, but it gives you an idea of kind of how we think about innovation and experimenting for the future. 